Hi everybody and welcome to the shed where basically we just play around with stuff. Hi everybody, so microbial fuel cells are pretty fascinating things and hold great potential. Of course there are challenges with them, but they work essentially because when microbes break things down, that is eat the stuff in the soil, all that inorganic matter, they release electrons. When they release electrons it's possible to capture them and use those captured electrons to power something. Now initially it was thought that this would be incredibly difficult because you would need special microbes, but it turns out just about every microbe will do this and all you really need is a bunch of soil and if you get some soil you're gonna have the microbes in there that you need. Normally when bacteria break down the organic matter, they surrender their electrons to oxygen in the air in exchange for energy. But in a microbial fuel cell, the electrons are forced to take a detour. A microbial fuel cell is actually a very simple device. It's just a tube with electrons on either side. One which is sealed off so the bacteria don't have access to oxygen and the other one which is exposed to oxygen. The microbes grow on an electrode, which is oxygen free. So they send off those electrons through a circuit where those electrons can be used to extract electrical power. The circuit's completed by the electrons ending up on the other side of the tube and combined with the oxygen in the air. So you're not going to light a city with these things anytime soon, but they are good for small devices, things like sensors. And with the growing internet of things and the desire for farmers to control crops, having hundreds of these things around is a thing that's wanted but nobody's going to do that if you have to run them from things like solar or batteries because basically you'd spend your life walking across a field replacing a thousand batteries. There's a lot of effort going into getting this to work and the main problem hasn't been the science behind how it's generated. The main problem has actually been the structure of the device itself. And that's because in order to function properly these devices have to work in dry or wet conditions. They have to work with oxygen and of course that's difficult if they're buried in the dirt. Microbial fuel cells actually first appeared in about 1911 but the problem stymied their use because their low power and unreliability meant that they couldn't be used particularly well and that's where Northwestern's McCormick School of Engineering stepped in and embarked on a long-term project to design a winning geometry. It's taken them something like 10 years, but the best performing prototype worked well in dry conditions as well as in waterlogged environment. And the secret behind its success? Instead of using a traditional design in which the anode and cathode are parallel to one another, the winning fuel cell leverages a perpendicular design. And it's been 3D printed. And the electrodes are made of carbon felt, which is cheap, abundant and innocuous. And although the entire device is buried, the vertical design ensures the top is flush with the ground surface and a 3D printed cap rests on top to prevent debris from falling inside and a hole on top and an empty air chamber running alongside the cathode enable consistent airflow. And on average the resulting fuel cell generated 68 times more power than the sensors needed and it lasted 120% longer than any other competing design and output 120% more power than other competing designs. Now the researchers say that all the components of their microbial fuel cell can just be bought locally from a hardware store and they plan on working on one that is completely biodegradable. What's really cool about this is they're very keen for open access and for people to adopt it so the research paper is um, open access and a lot of the materials are there for people if they want to actually go in there and make something themselves that will utilize this design concept. That's very cool there's quite a lot of universities when they come up with an idea rush straight to the patent office. Here Northwestern is making it available. And in line with that open access public domain idea that they're uh, promoting, what they've done is create this video showing the complete construction. Now there is an issue or two in that parts of it are made from water jetted stainless steel, but to be honest, a hacksaw file and some patients will be able to reproduce those parts and they show you how to put it together layer by layer 
along with the completed cell structure so that it would be pretty easy to follow should anybody want to do that. Anyway, I thought it was really interesting about how microbial fuel cells have developed into what are looking like very usable devices. And if anybody would want to do that, I would recommend that you check the paper. Of course, I'll put the paper link in the description of the bottom of this video. So if you want to jump over and have a better read at that, then certainly do. Now, the claim is that this dirt-based fuel cell battery will basically last forever. It's quite a claim, but it's quite an invention. Hi everybody! So I might be being a bit early with this, but it's really quite exciting. And it's easy to do, and I thought anybody who wanted to give it a go might want to try and improve it. Now, in video 2198, when we looked at the spherical solar cell, then we looked at fluorescent acrylic. There's an example of one. This is a piece of acrylic filled with a fluorescent material and it acts like a light guide. It collects all the light here, bounces it around, absorbs it and re-emits it in a visible light that we can see along the edge. And that's why the edge of these things are always so much brighter. Now we want to have a look at this as being a waveguide, so what I'm going to do is turn the lights off and we'll see how that works. Okay, I've turned the overhead lights off so we can see this, and there's the reading on the meter, and here are my fluorescent panels, and let's hold them over the solar cell. <laughs> so here's my meter, here's the solar cell, let's put our fluorescent panels over and see what happens to the meter. Isn't that cool? So following that, I was asked in the comments whether there was a 3D filament that would act the same way. And to be brutally honest, I didn't know. So of course I went onto the internet and I found 1233D offering a fluorescent yellow filament. Now it didn't look like it was transparent and it didn't say it was, but I bought it anyway. And it is, and here it is. If we hold up that to the light, the light strikes this, and a bit like an optical fibre, it acts like a light guide, and you can see the fluorescence and the concentrated light coming out of the end of it. So of course, that was very promising. What we need to do now, obviously, is print something with it that will hopefully add as a light guide for our fluorescent solar cell edition. So what I did was, I printed this. This is just a triangle straight from Tinkercad, it's one of their primitives and I printed it 100% infill and I made sure that the infill was in lines and so now it's lines going in there. The idea is that I hold that section, the short face here, up to the light. The light should come in here, be reflected off of there, bounce down and hit the solar cell but it should also fluoresce at the same time. So let's give that a go. So here's my setup, meter here, silicon cell there, it's reading the ambient sunlight and voltage on the meter and of course I haven't got the block on, so let's add the block. That's the block on. And then the block back off again. And let's put the block back on. <laughs> and then back off again. And then back on, why not? That's awesome. So I thought that was really cool. We got over a 10% improvement for using this thing. And this obviously is a 90 degree uh, prism, a right angle prism. So we get total internal reflection. However, it is a big lump of plastic and it's not particularly well made. So your expectation would be putting something over a solar cell. It's going to obscure the light, but it didn't, which is really very cool. And of course, what we need to think about is making it transparent. And there are ways to make printed filaments transparent. But as I say, I got a little overexcited, so I wanted to tell you this immediately. Should somebody print this off or give it a go and try to make it transparent, it'd be brilliant if you shared that. So here's a surprising thing. Wind power generation outstrips solar by a surprising degree. And what's the reason for that? Well, 
clearly solar isn't very good and that's a real shame and it's kind of weird because of course the sun is responsible for generating the wind by heating the earth unevenly and in a single hour enough sunlight will fall on the earth to generate electricity enough for a year for all of humanity's needs so that's a lot of power that we're not collecting particularly well so clearly the technology of solar is well behind the technology of wind and of course this has made people do an awful lot of research into solar and how to get better use out of it without covering the entire planet in solar cells and what they're looking at is what's called concentrated solar. Now concentrated solar falls into two main camps. There's concentrated solar power, which is the stuff you see with lots of reflectors pointing at a central tower, heating water to create steam that's used to generate, and concentrated solar photovoltaics. So they're two very distinct things. Concentrated solar photovoltaics, or CSV as is more commonly known, uses arrangements of mirrors and lenses to focus light onto solar cells. Now normally what you see is an arrangement of lenses or mirrors or reflectors around a solar cell, but then a company called Hyperstealth had the idea of putting two things together. Now Hyperstealth had started by making camouflage units, uniting large lenticular lens to bend light around an object, and Guy Kramer, the CEO of the company, thought to himself, well what about if we stick a mirror behind it? And he did a lot of experiments on that and got three times the power output, which was quite astounding. Now, it does have a patent on it, but I thought I'd give that a go. Okay, so all I've got here is a little solar panel over on the right there that I bought from uh, Maplin when it was still trading. And then we've attached the uh, meter to it. It's reading uh, amps at the moment, 0.746 amps. And the load on it is a coil. It's a heating coil from a kiln, actually. And um, at that amps and the volts. The volts is about 20 volts. It actually gets quite warm. Okay, and you'll see this mysterious bit of timber at the bottom there. I feel like I'm a magician whipping the blanket off of something. It's ridiculous but I've covered that up because I'm about to pull it off and I want you to see the difference between the amps when it's um, uncovered and when it's covered so we've got it covered there and look at that that jumped to 0.834 of an amp so it went from 0.7 to 0.8 that's amazing actually Okay, it's dead simple. That is a lenticular lens. So there's a bit of prism film we pulled from the LCD. And behind it is a mirror. Now the mirror will increase it and the lenticular lens will increase it. But together they have a massive impact. Now I originally used a bit of aluminium foil. That worked quite well as well. And then I picked this mirror out of the bathroom, tried that, and that worked superbly. So apparently bit of a mirror surface, lenticular foil over the top of it, and we get a 12% <laughs> increase in the um, energy that a little solar panel like that can work, um, can put output. Now if you have a look at Hyperstealth's YouTube channel, you see that there's a ton of variations on that basic idea, including making tubes so that the snow drops off. It's really an excellent idea, but it has the same problem that all concentrated solar photovoltaics have, and that is they get hot. Because of course the sun puts out ultraviolet light, visible light and infrared, and infrared is what's responsible for heating. It's why solar thermal works. And if you're increasing the amount of sun that you're putting onto something like a solar panel, well you're going to warm it up. Now the standard approach to dealing with that is to do things like put cooling fins on or dribble water across the surface or put cooling water around the back of the solar panel because as solar panels heat up they reduce in efficiency. It's typically between 0.3 and 0.4 percent per degree of temperature rise. Of course if you shine more light on a solar panel it gives out more electricity but there's a point at which those two cross over and the benefit you get is offset 
by the degradation of the rising temperature. Now, of course, as we pointed out, you can keep it cooler by cooling it, but then you're increasing the complexity of the system and the amount of equipment you've got to put there and therefore increasing the cost quite dramatically. And that was a state of play until this bit of research came out. Now, it was done by the Netherlands Organisation for Applied Scientific Research, and all they actually did was go out to a solar farm where 90 panels had been hung vertically in an east-to-west direction, because it's been known for a while that if you hang solar panels vertically, you get these anomalous energy readouts. It's just that nobody's known particularly why, and that's what the study was about. And they found that the whole thing was down to temperature. If you're angling a solar panel to follow the sun, it stays hot. If you're hanging it vertical, then that temperature difference is responsible for the higher output. And it's about 3 to 5%, but of course there's more to it than that. It's much, much cheaper to hang these panels vertically. The framework is just cheaper. There's no solar tracking involved. There's no cooling involved. And without the heating up of the solar panels, the degradation of the panel isn't anywhere near as quick. This kind of thing is astounding and counterintuitive. Now that solar farm did use bifacial solar panels and they're between 11 and 23% more efficient than monofacial panels depending on where you site them because they can work off reflected light from the back. Of course they're a bit more expensive to produce by a few cents and the overall cost of the system rises by anywhere between 3 and 7% again depending on where you actually install them. But given the added life and the further increase by 5% of just just hanging them there. It's exactly the kind of engineering and approach to a problem that I love. Instead of overcomplicating things, just stick two sides there and let them dangle, gives a surprising counterintuitive result in that you get more out of it by doing less with it. This research only came out a couple of months ago, so I thought I would share it with you because I found it absolutely, well, fascinating and amusing that sometimes the solution to a problem is the simplest solution. Three days ago, this paper came out. Now, it might seem pretty dull and not very exciting, and that's so often the way it is. Great discoveries are so often made quietly without banners and flags, fireworks and fanfare. What it's reporting is that the experiment performed at the National Ignition Facility in California ran a nuclear reactor using nuclear fusion that, for the first time ever in the history of nuclear fusion, produced more energy out than it took in. About twice as much out. And that is a huge leap forward for making nuclear fusion a reality. Actually, this paper confirms an experiment done in 2022, and of course advancements have been made since then, producing even better results, apparently. And it's a historic milestone to get more energy out than you put in in a fusion experiment, because it means that one day we can have clean, limitless fusion energy. And it's a reality rather than a dream. To do this, the guys at the NIF generated the nuclear fusion reactions via a technique called inertial confinement fusion. Now, to drive the reactions, the researchers fired the beams of 192 high-powered lasers at a millimetre diameter cylinder that holds a high-density carbon capsule weighing only 4.25 milligrams. That capsule is filled with 220 micrograms of deuterium and tritium, which are two forms of heavy hydrogen. When hit by the lasers, the cylinder, which is known in the field as a holarum, acts like an extremely powerful X-ray oven, and it's designed so that the X-rays uniformly bombard the surface of the fuel capsule. That process heats the capsule and causes the flue fuel to implode, leading to a pressure of something like 600 billion atmospheres and a temperature of 151 million degrees centigrade. So the fuel is exposed to conditions that exceed those of the sun, which is round about 200 billion atmospheres and 16 million degrees centigrade. These conditions are clearly sufficient for the deuterium and tritium atoms to fuse into helium and release energy. 
There are two kinds of nuclear energy, nuclear fission and nuclear fusion. Nuclear fission is where you break things apart and it releases a lot of energy. Nuclear fusion is where you force things together and equally it creates a lot of energy. Now what you're forcing together is the nucleus, the centre of an atom. So you want to strip away the electrons and you want the centres of the atoms and when you push them together, of course those centres are both positively charged, they want to push apart again. You need to overcome that initial long-range push apart so they get close enough together so that the nuclear interaction will pull them together and the strong nuclear force will make them smash into each other. Now, what we use a lot, or what is used a lot, is hydrogen. Hydrogen is one proton and a more favoured one is deuterium, or heavy hydrogen, which is one proton and one neutron. You can also use tritium, proton and two neutrons. neutrons but they are the favoured materials because they're the lightest and the most abundant, and we can get those to smash together. If we can get them to smash together, we will get nuclear fusion and we get net energy out. Now, in order to do that, of course, you've got to do several things. First thing is you've got to strip the electrons away. Next thing is you've got to get them really hot so they're moving quickly. And the third thing is you've got to bring them close together. You've got to bring them near to each other because fusion is a probabilistic event. These things are always zipping around. At some level or other, they are going to hit each other. Just that normally they hit each other so rarely it's of no use whatsoever. So we need to up that rate at which they hit each other. You do that by bringing them close together. Now there are three kinds of hot fusion. What we're trying to do is mimic the uh, processes that go on in the sun. And we do that by creating one way a large magnetic field. And that's in a device called the tokamak. It creates a large magnetic field. You heat up your hydrogen ions to super hot temperatures, confine them close together, and we get fusion. Another way of doing that is with inertial electrostatic confinement. So instead of using a magnetic field, we use an electrostatic field which creates a pen potential well, holds that hot plasma in a confined space, and we will get fusion. Of course, the third way is the way the sun does it, which is gravitational. Of course, there are a whole host of other methodologies, usually going under the umbrella of cold fusion, and these include things like lattice and train fusion and um, muon catalyzed fusion. But the hot fusion techniques are the ones that are looking more promising for our current stage of technology, with the US obviously announcing this major breakthrough, but France and England, using tokamak research, say they aren't very far behind that, whereas the more esoteric processes have got a bit of a way to go. But it is clearly a very important field, with billions of dollars being poured into this development because of its future promise. Now, whenever you hear the word nuclear energy, of course, we think of nuclear fission, that very different kind of energy, and the problems associated with that in terms of waste generation, disposal and storage. When it comes to nuclear fusion, you're not talking about anything like the amount of reactants used. In order to compete successfully with a nuclear fission plant, a nuclear fusion plant would use something like four or five grams of material. So the are orders of magnitude different in terms of how you would approach them for the safety aspect and the pollution aspect that really, to a degree, has dogged the nuclear industry courtesy of things like Chernobyl and Fukushima. So, normally you want to make a generator, you grab yourself a motor. This is a universal motor and this, which is from a hoverboard, is a brushless DC motor. Which is okay because that's the way the bulk of generators are actually made. But there are conditions, for example, in a missile or a rocket, where the conditions are just so harsh that that kind of generator, well, it won't cut the mustard. And there are other times... For instance, you need a very high frequency, high power. A generator like that just couldn't keep up with it. But there are alternatives, and it might be worth looking at those alternatives to see what we might be able to do with this kind of generator. Now, in this one, when you spin it, what you're doing is you're spinning the magnets around some coils. In this one, when you spin it, what you do is spinning some coils within a magnet, because the magnets are on the outside, and here the magnets are on the inside, so to speak. But either you spin the magnets, 
or you spin the coils through the magnetic field and then your motor becomes a generator because of course generators and motors are electrically equivalent machines but you have to spin one or the other so I wanted to show you this this is a coil from a fan this is pulled from a microwave as it happens and it's that coil there I pulled it out stuck it there and then I've put some magnets on the back of that coil so now both the magnets and the coil are stationary and of course they're glued to this board so they're not going anywhere. What I've got here is a bit of steel. If I move that steel like that LED. Well that means obviously is we're generating and we're generating something without moving either the coils or the magnet. Personally, I find that a little bit mind-blowing because I'm used to thinking of moving the magnetic field and moving the magnetic field, I'm used to think of in, thinking of it as spinning the coils or spinning the magnets because motion is relative. Here, we're moving the magnetic field in a completely different way. We're actually using the property of the magnet. The magnet wants to find the least path of resistance. It wants to go through something it can go through. Now, it's going through this steel at the center of here and it's kind of spreading out in the air. The minute I do that, all that rushes up here because this is the path of least reluctance. It, reluctance is that property of magnetism where it wants to follow the path of the least reluctance in the same way that electricity follows the path of least resistance. So it'll go in and out of that steel as I move the steel off and on that piece of iron. And of course what we're doing then is we're forcing the magnetic field to move without moving the magnet. That's very cool. This switched reluctance, which is what it is, we're varying the reluctance and switching it by moving it, that variable reluctance can be used as a generator, and indeed it has been used as a generator. The first generator designed for this was in 1904, and it was called the Alexanderson generator. It came in huge kilowattage, kind of like 5 kilowatts, 100 kilowatts, massive really, and um, they used it for generating radio frequency because the frequency is dependent on how quickly I do that. Now I've got this on a rectifier right there, so we're getting DC out. But it was used to generate high power radio frequency until about the 1920s or so when it was overtaken. Using a, a lump of steel against that iron core because it's really easy to demonstrate, but the Alexanderson generator had a huge rotor made out of steel with slots cut in it, and those slots acted the same way as this little bit of steel that I'm using. And you're able to switch that flux or uh, find the path of least reluctance and then generate from it. Now, this is not a curiosity, this is something we actually use even now. So, it was used in the uh, 1900s. Uh, as a method of generation and it's used now. This idea is also used in the makeup of guitar pickups. When the string or steel string vibrates across that iron core it generates and of course that generation is then picked up and amplified and that's how guitar pickups work. Now Alexanderson was a, a, a Swedish engineer and he's really quite famous so much so that there is in fact an Alexanderson day in Sweden it's on the um, last Sunday of June or the first Sunday of July whichever is nearest the second of July it's actually the predominant um, power supply for missiles and the reason it's the predominant power supply for missiles like the Sparrow and that kind of thing is it's incredibly robust because of course what you've got is a rotor of just slotted steel there's nothing on it there's no need for slip rings there's no need for coils you just make that rotor out of slotted steel put it in some bearings and spin it now obviously it produces very high frequency you've spun at very high speeds and that's why it was used for radio when they put it into a um, missile then they power it one of two ways either it has its own gas power supply or quite often it's used for a tiny bit of exhaust is jetted over a turbine and then that is used to spin that wheel so how is that useful to us well there's a number of things that i can suggest one is the simplicity of construction obviously it's best used at high speed because speed is a factor remember so it's strength of magnetic field, turns of wire that's been cut by that magnetic field, and then the speed at which that happens. 
So a turbine is a brilliant application for this. So you would get an incredibly rugged device driven directly by a turbine that we could produce huge amounts of power that you can make simply. All of those things just seem like massive pluses to me. So I wanted to introduce this idea of switching the uh, flux and then the, the thing has been used and is still used and is relatively in these terms easy to do and it uses something we don't often consider. That is changing the path of the magnetic field so it cuts through this coil is equivalent to rotating the magnetic field. What we need is a changing magnetic field. We can create that changing magnetic field either by rotating the magnets, rotating the coils, or in this case, giving the field somewhere else to go. We're bending that magnetic field, which I really like. So anyway, I thought I would introduce this idea to you of um, switching the reluctance, or if you like, switching the flux, and this idea of a flux switching alternator that has been used over time. So spirals, well they're absolutely everywhere in nature, from galaxies to sunflowers, wave formations and wind types, but really, surprisingly, there are only really four types, and they're the Fibonacci spiral, the logarithmic spiral, the golden ratio spiral, and the Archimedes spiral. Now, mathematicians will hate this, but from an engineering build it and see what it does point of view, you could say that the Fibonacci, golden ratio, and logarithmic were in fact pretty much the same thing, which would break them down into two basic groups. Now, if you want to know more about spiral formation, the mathematics behind it, there's a chap called Ziroth who's done a brilliant video on it, and I'll put a link to the end of this video and a link in the description to Ziroth's video if you want to jump over there and get a better understanding of how spirals are actually drawn and framed, and a little bit about the history of the mathematics behind it. But I'm of a more practical bent, of course, and what I want to explore is how spirals have been used in wind turbines. Now the simplest wind turbine has got to be the Savonius. It's basically two cups that catch the wind and there's a difference in dragons so they spin. And the first thing that was looked at was that and it came up in this paper. So what the team did was take a Fibonacci spiral and use that as the inspiration for the Zephonius type blade. And they tested it in lots of configurations, so overlapping gaps, uh, matching gaps, two, three, four blades, and they found that the best configuration was with two blades and no gap in between them. And they ran a series of tests and came up with the result that it had an improved power coefficient of 14.1%. Of course, this spread like wildfire and you found people doing turbines, Savonius type turbines, in that configuration all over the place. Of course, that sort of stuff always inspires people. And in 2018, this paper came out. What this team did was to construct a conical spiral, and they did that by taking the Fibonacci spiral, laying it on a flat piece of paper, cutting it out and rolling that round to make part of the cone. They repeated that three times and put those blades together at 120 degrees to come up with their conical spiral wind turbine, which they then promptly tested, of course. And the results were truly astounding. They got 73.1% with an idea that they should be able to get up to 80% of the power extracted, the available power extracted from the wind. And that's well, it's phenomenal when you think about it. Equally, that went around like wildfire and is the inspiration from the Liam F1 wind turbine, which everybody's talking about at the moment, and for replication efforts, including one by myself. It'll be, so it should be, set on a pole like that. That's 0.9 metres a second and it's actually starting to turn. One point six meters per second. Now we did 
did some generation testing back here at the lab and got some pretty good results. But if you want full build details, they're in video 1998, and I'll put a link to that at the end of this video. I 3D printed mine, of course, because I've got 3D printers. But if you follow that research paper, then you could use the same procedure of laying out a flat sheet and rolling that sheet up into the cone if you wanted to make one if you don't have a 3D printer. One of the things that's quite astounding about this spiral turbine is it's one of the first ones to make it out of the research lab into actual product, which is what the Liam F1 is, because so often these things just stay in the papers. When they actually get out there, that's a bit more inspiring. Now, both the papers I've quoted in this video are open access. It means they're not behind a paywall. Anybody can go and read them. And if you go to Google Scholar and put in spiral wind turbine, you'll find that there's a ton of corroborating research now to show that these spirals actually are worth pursuing. Now, sometimes you'll find them called an Archimedes spiral. I mean, they're not, OK? They're a Fibonacci spiral, usually. I guess it's some kind of nod to the Archimedes screw, but they are still a spiral turbine, and there is an awful lot of it out there for people to have a look at and judge for themselves whether they're any good or not. From where I sit, they certainly seem to be an impressive improvement on what it has we've been doing. And the Liam F1 has suddenly become of great interest to me as well. So, I hope you've enjoyed the video. Thank you very much for watching. And please do remember to like and subscribe.